uh, do in this series is uh, take seriously that uh, Jesus is an elephant uh, in the sense that uh, he is big. He is much bigger than we are. Uh, but how many of you know that the relevance of Jesus in this moment, dare I say, for the whole of our lives is fairly significant in my hope and prayer as we launch this series around rediscovering Jesus, the Jesus I never knew, is that we all uh, may grab a home to whatever part of Jesus we uh, are familiar with, but also be open uh, that there's some uh, revelation that Jesus would like to bring into our lives. Is that all right? All right, let's uh, turn to the text. Mark chapter number 8 is what we'll uh, spend uh, the, the good uh, 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 chunk of our time in our biblical text. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Uh, I think it's on the screen. Uh, and uh, Mark is the uh, first gospel that has been written out of, of four gospels. Many people, uh, scholars, have dated it. Uh, to be written in the uh, mid to late 60s, which was put in about 30 years after the death of Jesus. You have eyewitness testimony then of the life of Jesus that has been captured uh, by people uh, through verbal witness, and uh, Mark has captured it, written it down, and uh, in the process of uh, this writing, we find uh, the first gospel first eyewitness account, if you will, of the life and the ministry of Jesus. Uh, Mark is a uh, very powerful, powerful uh, contribution to the biblical text, and uh, we're going to take a look at one of the many uh, encounters that uh, have been captured uh, by the writer, uh, who probably got his eyewitness account from Peter himself, since uh, Mark was one of these folks that hung around Peter and was discipled by him. Uh, in any respect, let us take a look at the text to see what the scripture says. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elisha, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. All right, so we're going to take the next few moments and launch this series, a uh, series where we will uh, be moving down a collective path to rediscover Jesus. And uh, certainly uh, launching this series, we'll talk for the next few minutes about who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Bow your hands with me and uh, let us ask the blessings of God in this space. Father, we thank you once again for the power of your spirit. We thank you that you've given it to us, Lord God, to live with us and dwell with us. And I pray that as I stand to preach and teach your word, we will send the anointing of your spirit that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers, Lord God, and uh, cause us to grow uh, and be challenged uh, as we hear the word of God today. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. All right, tell the person next to you, who do you say Jesus is? Ask them that, who do you say? Jesus. Now, appreciate my brother and my sister that this is a question that uh, is not being asked for the first time. Uh, that, dare I say, for uh, the whole of the life of Jesus, ever since he came into this world in human form, uh, as soon as he was born, dare I say, even before he got here, folks are trying to figure out, who is Jesus? I want to submit to you that it is a question that uh, is of critical concern. One writer, Paul Tillich, calls it a question of ultimate concern. That there are many questions you and I can ask throughout the course of our lives, and uh, not all of these questions are weighted with equal importance. Uh, some of us, amen, uh, struggle to figure out what we're going to wear in the morning. Some of us struggle to figure out if we're going to get up in the morning. Some of us struggle to figure out if we're going to pay our bills this month. Some of us struggle to figure out if we're going to, uh, you know, uh, 
go get help for a particular challenge in our life. Uh, but how many of you know that there are some questions that are more important than others? There are some struggles, there are some inquiries, there are some uh, dilemmas, if you will, that require a different level of investment, a different level of reflection. I want you to appreciate, my brother and my sister, also uh, that this question of who Jesus is, uh, if you pull out some of the text from uh, the Gospels, you'll find that as we answer or ask this question, we won't be the first followers of Jesus or curious folk to lift up these questions. I pulled out a few passages in the Gospels where these kinds of questions were being raised. Uh, because it was very interesting to me uh, that some folk uh, will get so holy and sanctified, they'll stop asking God questions. Mm. They'll stop being curious and, and, and stop uh, being uh, 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 probative, if you will. They'll just you know, get real kind of settled down in what they assume they already know. But here in the biblical text, you find a number of inquiries being raised. In Matthew chapter number 13, verse 54, you can write these down and, and study them a little bit later. It says that when Jesus had come into his own country, he taught them in their own synagogue. And they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brother James and Joses and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. Mark chapter number 15 verse 2. It says that as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Who are you? Are you the king of the Jews? Luke chapter 17, verse 18. More inquiries. The disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin? He had reported all these things, heard all these reports about Jesus. So John summoned two of his disciples and he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you he? Are you the one who is to come? Or should we be looking or waiting for another? You keep going further into some of these gospel letters. In John chapter number 1 verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets have written, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. But Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, you have all of these different encounters and these different uh, uh, opportunities where Jesus is making himself plain. But yet people are still asking the question, who is Jesus? And even if you go past the Gospels, you'll find, say, in the book of Acts, chapter number 9, when uh, Saul, who would soon become Paul, Saul is getting ready to go persecute a bunch of folk, and, and as he's going along the Damascus road, the scripture says in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and Saul fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, persecuting me and Saul's response was who are you Lord? Amen. I mean ain't it something that you have all these kind of encounters with the Lord and when God really comes running up in your face or God really starts to make himself plain in your life you're still left with a lingering question who are you? Have you ever had that kind of experience with God. God, I know you've done some things. I know you've been better than me than I can be to myself. And, and I know that, you know, you are making a way out of no way. And you are being a bridge over troubled water. And you are, you know, knocking down every single obstacle in my way. But I still got some questions about who you really are. <coughs> See, I want to submit to all of us that this is not a new reality around inquiry and question related to Jesus. Certainly, I was uh, and have been a 
uh, captivated by uh, the Black Jesus series that has been on TV and, and, and all the, 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 the hoopla. And, you know, you have some folk who find it, you know, super curious, and then you have other folks who find it to be blasphemous and an offense. And I was reading an article about uh, 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 the author or the, the writer of the series, and he was very interestingly saying, you know, even though it is satire, I really am trying to, to lift up uh, in, in, in real time, if Jesus was alive today, what would he be up to? Because when you read who he hangs out with in the Gospels, Man, it's serious that, you know, he's hanging out with some scandalous people. So much so that folk were beginning to call Jesus' own self-description into account based off of the people he was hanging out with. Jesus hanging out with some prostitutes. And folks were like, well, you know, the only kind of people hanging out with prostitutes <laughs> are people who enjoy being with prostitutes. <laughs> Or Jesus would hang out with, with, with sinners and, 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 and thieves. And you're like, you know, the only, the only people who hang out with, 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 with thieves and sinners, you know, are the kind of people who, you know, enjoy sinning and thieving. I mean, maybe that whole phrase, birds of a pleasant flock, flock together, actually started in the time of Jesus. <laughs> because folk were, like, hating on Jesus based off of his crowd. But I, I, I appreciate the, 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 the author or the writer of this series because he's trying, at least in his own, you know, kind of self-narrative in this, in this interview, he's trying to lift up, if Jesus were here today, I'm curious, what would he be up to? I'm curious about who he is and what he is really like in real life and in real time. And it made me think very deeply about how ever since Jesus left off the scene and left all these folk with all these experiences, folks have been struggling to figure out who he is. Many of you may know and may have heard of all these different kinds of councils and conventions that, that the early church gathered in to try to hammer out some clear lines because folks were starting to get a lot of wild and who Jesus was and they were struggling to put all the pieces together so they got some of the smartest folk and some of the folk who, who were uh, eyewitness uh, 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 disciples if you will of the eyewitness people who actually were, were hanging out with Jesus they pulled them all together in some of these kind of conventions and the first uh, effort at trying to delineate or describe who he is was captured in what they called a creed it was a recitation or, of, of, or a citation, if you will, of, of who Jesus was. The first one uh, we'll put up on the screen. I'm just going to walk us through a couple of these so you can kind of appreciate that for millennia, folks have been struggling to answer this question. We call this the Apostles' Creed. And this creed was developed in the second century, all right? And folks got together and they began to start to pull together some of the, uh, the broad stroke narrative and truth of, of what people uh, describe Jesus to be. And it says that I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then when they get to Jesus, this is how they describe him. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the quick and the dead. This is where they landed. They said, okay, if we're serious about defining the life and the work and the function and the purpose and the ministry of Jesus, this is a good start. And, 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 and this will help create some, some barriers and some, or some boundaries, if you will, so folks can know that if you can say this with confidence, you're in the right arena. Then a couple hundred years later, they all started to realize, wow, what, 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 what does it mean? Jesus is really divine. So the next creed that I'll lift up, and I'll just pull out uh, the, the Nicene Creed, the part in here 
that talks about Jesus. Now you can see the part about Jesus has now gotten a little bit longer. But it still goes on to say, and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. Some kind of a creed. But they got together and they, they were starting to really build out and fill out and answer this question of who Jesus is. And then some years later, they came to another council and they began to see, wow, you know, we're, we're really beginning to understand even more fully. Pull up the next one, the Chalcedon Creed. Now I won't read that one. <laughs> Amen. But clearly you get the point of what I'm trying to say, hopefully. That there, from the beginning of the time Jesus showed up, people have been wrestling with this question of who Jesus is. And what is his significance for my life here in the present and my life in the future and there I say even my life eternal. That every generation has struggled and found this question to be of ultimate concern. And in this moment, 2014, with all that is going on around us, I want to submit to you that this question is still very relevant for us today. That just like there were people who have been for generations writing books and studying and preaching and praying and asking questions and trying to, to come to a conclusion that you, even in this moment, must begin to appreciate that every generation has the charge to answer and wrestle with this question of who Jesus is. And while some folk may put it on TV in a series called Black Jesus, while some folk may put it on a movie screen in a, in a movie called the Bible, while some folk may write songs about it or paintings, while some folk may come to worship or read the Bible text or preach about it, how many of you know all of us have a responsibility and opportunity to ask the question, who is A writer I use very often says in his book entitled Your God is Too Small, he says that the trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for contemporary needs. So while their experience of life has grown in a score of directions and their emotional horizons have been expanded to the point of bewilderment by world events and scientific discoveries, their ideas of God have remained largely static, stale, and antiquated. I think that the reason why some folks stop asking who Jesus is is because they get locked into a small idea of who he is and the impact he can have in our lives. Because how many of you know the older you get and the more complex your life becomes, right. what you learned about Jesus in Sunday school may not be able to answer the grown up questions you have today. I wish I had a church in here. I mean, I know that you learned all them nice, you know, songs like they learned back there today, and you learned all these nice 
you know, answers with a bow on the top. But how many ever had something happen in your life and you were like, mm, ah, what they told me this don't mean? Somebody say amen. Well, but when I heard them say this don't fit, I, I, I need a Jesus that's big enough to handle all the mess and all the ugliness all right. that's going on in my life. Yes, sir. Come on. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is bigger than your mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's bigger than your struggle. He's bigger than your problem. You have to just find a way to look with a different set of eyes at the Jesus who is bigger than any situation your life can bring your way. And if you and I can take a few moments, take a few years, maybe even the rest of our lives to remain in a place of inquiry and curiosity about who Jesus is, I believe some of the questions we have. I believe some of the things we're struggling with. I'm convinced some of the issues that are, are nagging at us and, and, and won't easily be detached will find a resolution in the one who has been here from the beginning and has never met a situation that he could not come. I don't know, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I'm so glad I serve a Savior who has yeah. been Everything life has had to bring his way and still find power to handle my stuff. Hallelujah. How many know we serve a God who, who don't run out of power? Amen. Amen. But the God we serve always has enough power. Tell your neighbor, God has enough for you. Amen. And, and if you and I can just dig a little deep, I think we could stumble into some victory. Stumble into this Jesus that you never knew. Now here in this text we find a great example of what I believe uh, must be some, some principles throughout this whole series and I'm gonna ask you to stay with us for the next couple of months, amen. If you, if you miss a couple of Sundays, amen, try to go to the YouTube channel or, or the video channel and try to stay caught up because we're gonna try to build, amen, over the next weeks and the next months this, this source of material, these sets of questions, these, these principles that I believe will position you and I to rediscover Jesus. Here in this passage, we see that they are in many respects uh, uh, hanging out with Jesus and Jesus is doing what Jesus does. Now, I don't, if you like me, I love to hang out with Jesus, amen, because you don't never know where your meal's going to come from. Amen. But you know you're going to eat way up, so I say amen, right? You don't know, you don't know where you're going to sleep at night, but you know you're going to get you some sleep, praise God. You don't know if you're going to run into a storm, but you know you're going to always get through the storm, all right, so I say amen. You don't know if you're going to get sick, but you know you're going to, I just love to just hang out with I've been like physically with Jesus. Mm -hmm. But since I came, Praise God. Physically, I'm so glad he's hanging out inside. Uh, uh, anyhow, anyhow. You, you find a, a wonderful kind of expression of Jesus being Jesus. He had just done a whole bunch of nice miracles. And if you look at the, the text, he, he fed 5,000 folk. Another text said, another one of the accounts said that after he fed 5,000 folk, he, he made a blind man see. I mean, Jesus did all these kind of cool things. And, and Jesus, though, always retreated from the crowds. And he retreated to his smaller group of friends, or disciples, if you will, and he began to ask them questions. And it is often in these kinds of conversations that Jesus has with his disciples that I find some of the greatest opportunities for you and I to find a fresh or new look of Jesus. One of the first things that you find in this passage is that he's taking them and, and the scripture says that Jesus is going with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asks his disciples, who do you say or who do people say that I am? My first point that I want to lift up as we go along this series is that the rediscovery of Jesus or a fresh look of Jesus will often happen in the course of your life's journey. 
that you will find out a new look or perspective of Jesus as you're going along the way of life. And my brother and my sister, one of the questions that I want to lift up as an important question is, are you on a journey of life that makes space for a fresh discovery of Jesus? Hmm. Have you made space in your life for Jesus to make himself a new presentation in your eyes? The scripture says that as they were going on their way, they began to have these conversations with Jesus. And I am convinced that there are a lot of us who are easily finding our journey stuck in park. Huh. Our faith walk is not one that is constantly moving, but for whatever reason, we get stuck in a rut. Huh. Glad to be honest with you here today. Yeah. Man, man, my faith, my walk with Christ, my, my, my inquiries, my questions, my conversations with God, they kind Park. Yes. They're stuck because there's a whole lot of things happening in my life that have me stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, maybe it's not you, but that's your neighbor. Do you know any stuck folk in there? Just folk that's just, just, just stuck. And, and, and I don't want to minimize the things that make us get stuck in a rut. Injustice can make you and I feel like our faith and the relevance of Jesus may not be what can keep us moving. Sexism, racism, all these other isms can, can become the ditches that cause you and I to fall and get stuck in a rut. Many things, addictions, hardships, disappointments, can cause you and I to get stuck in a rut and we are not along the way with Jesus. Yeah. Kanye West, he wrote a great rap back in the day, uh, about 10, I don't know, years ago, maybe. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> that song was cracking, right? <laughs>
walk with Jesus, I, I just got a feeling he's going to keep you moving. He, yeah. you got to go through it. Yeah. Our, 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 our Christian-based witchcraft. Mm. 
We, we, we just need our, our, our nice little games and manipulations and Machiavellian schemes. But I'm here to tell you, there will come a time in your life where you will need to go to the Caesarea Philippi. Jesus is going to try to show you something you ain't never seen before. My question is, will you follow him to that place? And will you be open to that revelation? The third thing that we see in this text is that Jesus is asking them while they're going along the way, while they're in Caesarea Philippi, he begins to ask them, who do people say that I am? And everybody has got an opinion. One says, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. She's like, I, I can see that because, you know, me and John, we cousins and whatnot, you know. So jeans, you know, got our hairs a little, you know. You know, you know, thick, praise God. You know, I, I can see that. Same dark te textured skin. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Some say you Elijah. Oh yeah, Elijah, you know, he, you know, he went up in a chariot of fire, you know, so I can see a fiery kind of guy. Some say he's a prophet. Everybody has an opinion of who Jesus is, but understand that other people's opinions may not always be based in truth. Right. Everybody got an opinion about who Jesus is. But given all the opinions out there, my brother and my sister, the question is, have you committed yourself to discovering really who he is and what is the relevance for your life? Because how many of you know if you talk to a hundred folk, a hundred folk will have probably a hundred different opinions about who Jesus is. Oh, he was a prophet. Oh, he was somebody's imagination. Oh, he was he was this, this Jewish guy. Oh, he was this rabbi. Oh, he was this great revolutionary. Jesus was a community organizer. I had somebody tell me that before. <laughs> Jesus a whole lot of things. But just because someone says he something don't mean it's true. I call that the he said, she said gospel, you know. Well, this is what he said, this is what she said, that's what they said. My grandmama them said Jesus this, and my papa them, my mama them, they said Jesus this. But the question, my brother and my sister, is what do you have to say? About who Jesus is? Understand that Jesus has not given you uh, uh, this question with nothing for you to base it on. He's given you some notes to read. If you don't read nothing else, you should read every red letter in your Bible. And just let the words of Jesus touch you. Let the words of Jesus wash over you. Let the words of Jesus penetrate your mind. Penetrate your heart. It's, 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 it's the words of Jesus that he's left that can give you an opportunity to understand who he is. And it's not just your words, sometimes, or not just the words he left, but sometimes he'll use your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. anyone, anyone got a testimony or a story that, that you said, you know, I'm learning who Jesus is by what he did in my life. Yes. Yes, sir. I read some words on the page, but, but you know, the longer I walk with Jesus, I begin to understand yes. that the words on the page became alive. To me. Those words on the page began to mean something to me. Those words on the page became something that now I can even write my own pages. All right. Of who he is. Yes. Everybody's gonna have an opinion, my brother. My sister. The question is, are you committed yeah. to discovering one based on the truth of his word and the letter of your life? And then the final thing, my brothers and my sisters, you'll find in this passage, Jesus asking them all these questions. They coming up with these answers. But Jesus asked them, all right, forget about what everybody else has to say. What is your answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who do you say that I am? Yeah. Even with all of the input from the peanut gallery, you got to come to your own conclusion. Yes, yeah. Who is Jesus? Yeah. And the nations, one of these 
said African church fathers from North Africa. I think Carthage, one of them, I don't know, I think from Carthage. I don't know where Athanasius was from. But, you know, he showed up as African. His nickname, they called him the Black Dwarf. I don't know if that was a term of endearment or what. But obviously, he was dark skinned, he was short. <laughs> and he, the first early church leader who named the New Testament to be the 27 books that we have right now. He was there early on. Somebody say amen. Somebody say early on. He was there from the break of dawn early in the development of this Christian faith that we all are converted into. He says, and when you're talking about knowing the essence of God, that that part of God may be unknowable, but what we do know about God, we get to know through his actions. For his actions reach down to us. I hope you're, you're hearing that. We may not know God in his essence, but what we do know about God, we know through his actions. Yeah, right. For his actions reach down to us. Your thought process, the evidence that will come into account around how you come to your conclusion, my brother and my sister, is, with, is often going to be based out of what God does in your life. Right. So when he provides your needs, you call him Jehovah Child. Which means he then becomes your provider. When he heals your body, you learn. And you come to know him as Jehovah Rapha. Which means he is your healer. When he brings peace in the middle of every one of your storms. You come to know him as Jehovah Shalom. God, you are my peace. When you're in a fight and your arms are getting weary and you're losing and you can't advance against the enemy that is coming, you begin to know him as Jehovah Nisi. God, you fight every battle on my behalf and you win. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly? 
to us. But we have to be a people who are willing to take a fresh look. Can you put yourself in a posture and a position where God, I want to take a fresh look at who you are?